and now broadcast live in front of a live studio audience for the first time from the certified up to code WYZT studio. It's the Corny Collins Miss Hairspray Spectacular. He's Corny. <laughs> Welcome to this week's edition of What's So Funny, a show that talks about the funny with the people who make it happen. Our guest this week is making his sixth appearance on the program from sunny Ontario, where there was absolutely no snow in May. Fresh from the release of his new album, Story Yelling, he's here to do some storytelling. It's Mr. Rankin Vile himself, Darren Frost. And of course, our host is a man who's dreading phase two of the COVID response because it means he may have to shake hands with someone again. It's Guy McPherson. Never again, Sam. Never again. <laughs> are you not? Are you not a handshaker? Are you not a handshaker? <laughs> no, I've become one. You know, as you grow up, you have to shake hands. But yeah. I, when I was, you know, in my twenties, I would be like, "This is stupid. Why? I, I, why are we doing this?" I don't even like hugging my parents, let alone you know, handshaking a stranger. <laughs> I think it's it's something that has to go in the comedy world. I, I hate the handshake on and off stage, or on stage. I, I think it's so ridiculous. Oh, comedy specific handshake you don't like? No, yeah, that's pretty much the only one that I think is completely unnecessary. Yeah, why? Uh, because we're dirty people, and I don't want to touch other dirty people. Oh, I see. Really, there's <laughs> I a see. lot to be said for that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't wash my hands. Or I don't. I don't want the. I don't want the audience to think that I like that guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. It's, there's a f- fake contrived camaraderie. Although to be fair, I mean, get along with most people. So that's well, you I, do. I don't. Yeah. No. I, yeah. My. You don't get along with people, Darren. No, I don't. Oh. You do. You play up that you don't, <laughs> but you do, don't you? Tell I us, mean, it's all just an act. It's it's not all just an act. I mean, with age comes a little bit of wisdom and realizing people do things for different reasons. But okay. Who, yeah. who who I don't like, they know I don't like them, and those I like, they know I like them. There's no middle ground for me, and, and I'm fine with that. It's. I mean, it makes life, living life pretty easy if you don't have to worry about being fucked over by someone because you already suspect it. Excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> right off the top. Well, you know. Darren is here, as you said, Sam, for the sixth time, but this is your first time uh, with Sam Taunting, so it'll be the best time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there was one episode where Graham hosted and... Uh, Graham every- Clark hosted yeah. in 2007. Yes. That's right. And then once you uh, were a co-guest with your buddy, yep. Kenny... Yes. But that was the last time I spoke to Graham, so I'm hoping this isn't the last time I speak to Sam. I'll see you next time you come through Vancouver, that's for sure. <laughs> well, I'll see you in 2030 then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Not going to happen. Uh, Darren, uh, yeah, you were just on the verge of this big, big cross-Canada tour. Yes, my last one ever, yes. And then, oh, your last, what? Yeah. Say that again? Yeah, Why? La- it was going to be my last big cross-Canada tour. Oh, but um, not your last tour, just your last, last big one. Yeah, like kind of like I wanted to hit every province for this last kind of big tour. And then if I ever played Vancouver again five, ten years from now, whatever, or if I quit, whatever. But I'm actually really taking a hard stance and trying to get to every province and every place that I can go to in one calendar year. And then a pandemic. <laughs> That's, you know, that is just uh, appropriate for Darren Frost, of course. isn't it? Yeah, it gets me riled up. It makes me angry. You know, I had this comedy album all ready to go and to sell at shows. And see, I'm not a comic that sells a lot of stuff online. I sell at shows. That's my thing. People see it, then they want it. They just see a two-minute clip. It doesn't return to sales to me. I'm not so saying saying sales is everything. But when you have an album, you want it to sell. Mm-hmm. I generally sell shit at shows. That's how I do it. And so I had all these shows lined up, and then the pandemic. You're, good. You're, you're beginning to sound a bit like Brian Adams here. Well... I, I'm trying to get rid of my action figures right now. I'm I'm, I'm offering them with a free Chris Benoit doll, so hopefully they'll sell. <laughs> what was that reference? Chris Benoit. He's a a wrestler that her murdered his uh, wife and child. I beg your pardon. Is this when was this? I don't know what year it was, but it was a famous case guy. You yeah. know wrestling. I've never heard of this. You don't need to oh, be yeah. in wrestling to get this reference, guy. Yeah. Yeah, I killed, know, but he killed his wife and his kid and then killed himself. It was like a 
double homicide, then suicide. It was in and Florida, was, right? Yeah, it was in Florida. And what Canadian. happened is, yeah, he's Canadian, lives in Florida. Uh, then they measured his brain and they found out that due to all the concussions and all these other steroids and other factors, his brain led to him kind of almost like this psychic break. It's all this. There's a lot of documentaries about a guy. You should check it out. <laughs> I should get online and uh, yeah, get part of part of the uh, pop culture world. He was an all star wrestler, like uh, that kind of wrestling, yeah, or, or massive, an Olympic yeah. wrestler. Okay. Oh no, like yeah. a WWE. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a Chris Benoit. Wrestler. Did, yes. Did he have a <laughs> Did he have a stage name? No, that was his name. That was his stage name as well, Chris <laughs> Benoit. <laughs> Well, this is why I haven't heard of them. They gotta yeah. have some some flashy, flashy name. Sure, the killer, yeah. the killer, Chris Benoit. Then you'd remember. Oh, man, he'd always be the heel. <laughs> so, how are you? Uh, I, I saw pictures from your Facebook wall yes. of all the snow. Yes. When was that? That was uh, two or three days ago. Two. Or th- I live in Barrie, Ontario now, where life goes to die. It's about an hour uh, north of Toronto. So, we, yeah, we've had snow like three times in the last week. <laughs> that's yeah, funny. That's crazy. Yeah. Like it, coldest temperatures of the year in May. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it was minus seven here two days ago. <laughs> it was 21 degrees today. <laughs> yeah. But oh, the rain, man. they always talk about the rain in Vancouver and the cold up north. Yeah. Good point. We all suck. It's all trade offs. It's all trade offs. Yeah. Are you happy living an hour north? You talk about this on your album that came out yeah. earlier this year. Do you like living an hour north of Toronto? I do, uh, mainly because I'm slowly pulling back from kind of the showbiz touring life, as I said with this last thing. You know, it's just I'm going to be 50 next year and age is a motherfucker and I admit it and things are slowing down. So I don't have to be in the belly of the beast. Uh, I do my cartoon voices from home now, even during the pandemic. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my rent's paid that way. And so I don't have to be out grinding every night. And to be honest, it's not my bag anymore. That's a young guy's or gal's thing. It's just the grind is not for me anymore. You tweeted uh, not too long ago that if you had a time machine, you'd go back to 1991 yes. and tell tell your younger self that you made a mistake with yes. this whole comedy thing. Yeah. Part joking, probably. Yeah. Part of, well, first of all, it's all a joke. But <laughs> okay. uh, all no, of it. If, if I didn't do stand up, I wouldn't have met my wife. I wouldn't have met my kids. And so therefore I'd have no meaning in life. So it, it's all worth it. Well, but you would have met another wife and had different kids. Oh, guy. Yes, maybe. Maybe a better <laughs> wife. Maybe better kids. Thanks, guy. <laughs> maybe, right? Yeah. You got to look at the positive. Sure. This glass is, glass is 80% <laughs> yeah. full in guys' Just end world. it now. Start, yeah. it, start fresh. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, though, if you could go back to your 1991 self, yes. how, would you, how would you have changed things? I would have been a plumber. I would have got a job that I could do anywhere, anytime, set my own hours. I would have done something like that. I really would have. I mean, I, I got a degree in marketing to fall back on for like business reasons and things like that. And that's helped me out immensely in, in comedy. But uh, I just think that, I don't know. It's, 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 it's my old, my old comedy fan page used to be called 15 years of regret. Now it's 30 years of regret in some ways. <laughs> so it's, you update it every year. Yeah. Every year, every year. Yeah. Yeah. Weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am actually more hopeful now than I was say five years ago because I don't, I don't put the same stock in things that I did five, even 10 years ago. And I think it, it's like, there's an old quote that um, Elvis Costello said, and I'm kind of paraphrasing it. It's, you know, it's kind of cool to be 19 and angry at the world, but if you're 29, still angry at the same things, you're not really growing up. Mm-hmm. And I feel, I feel the same way now, almost 50. I'm not angry about the same things I was when I was 20 or 30. And I'm definitely not doing the same jokes. Thank God. Like some other comics, uh, you know, I am still doing new material. I am trying to flip it over, not as fast as I used to, but I still am. Why isn't it as fast as you used to? Because when you're grinding it out, it's easy to write and get in that headspace. If you're not on stage as much as it used to be, you're just it's not possible to grind out the same amount of material. I'm still grinding out more than the average comic probably at my level, but I'm not as fat as much as I'd like to. You mentioned that five years ago, or the, you know, different markers of success than sure. now, right? Yep. What can you yep. give us an example of what a marker then would be that isn't anymore? Well, almost like say, you know, twenty years ago, I made a deal with myself, and what yeah. I said is, every year I'm going to look at what's happened, and if it was better than the last year, and that's not just financial, but if I had mm. certain things that happened, then I'm going to stay in this game, and if I got to a year where it wasn't as good as the year before. 
That's strike one. I yeah. go to the next year, strike two. And if it was three years in a row of not doing well, I'd get out. I've never gotten yeah. to three because I use certain measurements. Now I measure it completely different. Now I say to myself, what's the least amount of work I can do, still be a stay-at-home dad, and still not put a gun in my mouth? Yeah. And so far, I'm doing all right. Well, the voiceover work from home certainly helps. Immensely. Yeah. Immensely. Like, it's it's night and day for me. Do you have a cartoon voice, or do you just do Darren Frost? I have all kinds of cartoon voices, but traditionally I fall into two or three kind of reoccurring characters, either the bully, which is my angry voice, or the dumb guy, or the you know the not-so-smart guy, which I can do, and it pays my rent. It's awesome. Yeah. Like, they, and your kids can watch you, unlike your stand-up. Yeah, but they don't. They don't. They've never watched a single <laughs> oh. show. They could care less. They're, I'm like, look, this show's not a, for your not age Not the group. cartoons? Not even the cartoons. Yeah. They never have. What do they like? Well, they're like, are you Max? Are you Ruby? No, we could care less. Go fuck yourself, pretty much. Attitude-wise. <laughs> now, in mm-hmm. Vancouver, it used to be the great kind of voiceover work was in anime dubs. Are you doing yep. any of that stuff yep. as well? I have in the past. I was on a show called Bakugan Brawlers, which is a huge show around the world. I've done... Yeah you know, three different seasons of that. I have done it. It doesn't pay as well. And you throw your voice out. Like literally every, oh. every time you're doing it, you're yelling so much, you rip your voice out. And if I can't work the next day or do stand up because I'm tasting blood, I got to be really careful with that kind of thing. So I just take it a little bit here and there, not as much as say others, yeah. but you know, I still have done it. Yeah. Huh. But there's not much, I hate to say this and I'm, I may never get hired again. There's not much soul in those kinds of cartoons because well, no. you're just, you're just matching the mouth. You're just yeah. matching the mouth. That's all you're doing. There's no real kind of creativity to it. There's no, I mean, other people would argue with me because they make their living at it, but it's not as good as doing a normal cartoon where you're playing a character and then they draw the mouth around it. Do you get the script and then uh, try to, figure out your motivation. Do you spend a lot of time with it before you go to record? Uh, It depends when it's a new cartoon. Yeah. You're spending a couple hours with each script to make sure you want to impress them. You want them at the end to go, wow, we're glad we hired you. Mm. And then by season two of a show, I, you know, I read the script the night before for 20 minutes and that's it because I know the character. I know all the lines pretty much. I've said all these things before. There's a lot of repetition in cartoons. So it's like a lot of like reactions and things like that. So I don't have to really worry about it. I always wonder with these voice actors who do many different roles and different voices, how you, how you keep them straight when it, like <laughs> make sure you get the same character when you're, you know, the yeah, same yeah. intonation and all well, that. What generally happens is you mark a certain line that unlocks a character And then they'll play that right before you record to give you a reference. Ah. And if you've done your job and that, that line unlocks the character, it's kind of almost like a trigger in your head. Boom. I can do that character for three hours now Mm -hmm. without that line. It doesn't set a mood or a tone. Then you might have a little bit more trouble with the character. Hmm. Hey, there are so many adult comics now. I mean, uh, you know, cartoons. Do you do any of those? You do? Okay, no. good. Cause I, no, no. No, you don't. No, I, I oh, never have. I never have. Never. It's all preschool. A lot of stuff in Canada. There's very few adult cartoons that are actually produced in Canada. The majority of it is teen and younger. The oldest thing I've ever been on is a show called 16, and that was for kids like 12 to 14 years old. Yeah, have you watched uh, the Corner Gas animated? I have not. Oh, really? I've seen clips, you know, just to get an idea of it. I mean, I love Brent and he's a good guy and I want to see what the the style of it is, but I didn't watch a whole episode or anything like that. I don't really watch cartoons that much. So I haven't even watched my own shows, to be honest. <laughs> How Well, I can understand that if they're for preschoolers. Yeah. Little, little over your head. Sure. How old are the kids, your kids now? 16, uh, 13 and 10. Fun fun i can imagine now they might have seen your comedy or you say they absolutely don't care about any of it they don't watch it they don't like to watch it they they know about it i mean they so you've had the discussions about it this is what daddy does and listen don't repeat it oh i mean i there's a one of my old bits on one of my dvds i don't know which one it was my at one time my 12 year old came up to me and said you know, why do you have to swear? Why do you have to say these words? And I literally said to him, every time daddy swears, we eat, you know, like that's the way it is. Like uh, if, if I say motherfucker, we go to Disneyland. That's how it works. But it's not just swearing, Darren. No, of right? course not. Of I course mean, not. there's also taking your kids in a van and driving it into the river. 
Sure. And they'll be old enough to understand that when they have kids of their own. <laughs> it's the frustrations of any parent, right? It's, of course. It's, yeah. You know, it's like homeschooling. Homeschooling can lead to kid death. You know, I'm, am I joking? Of course I am. But every parent can understand the idea of the frustration of like, oh man, is this going to keep going? You know, that's why you think about driving your van into the water like uh, Susan Smith did. <laughs> this you is know, our guest. You know who Susan Smith is, right? She wrestled. She wrestled in the I do. I do know that one. <laughs> uh, I, I do. I did get that reference. So, hey, Darren, we got to get you to do something now. If you scroll to the bottom of the page, see how your reading is. You're yeah. not going to get 20 minutes with this, okay? You just, okay. just we're going. Let me hold on one second. Uh, bu- 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 let me grab my glasses because I'm elderly. Here we go. All right, here we go. This is Darren Frost, and you're listening to What's So Funny on CFRO 100.5 FM Vancouver Co op Radio. Beautiful. Nailed it. Oh, it's the best yeah. we've had. Like a true, yeah. a true professional. That's right. Uh, yes. Uh, so back, you know, your kids, they understand it. They get what daddy does. They, <laughs> they're not well, interested. Been there. They've been when people come up to me and they'll forget that I, my kids are the, Hey, fucky, fucky. Cause that used to be the name I call the guy in the front row. It's like a <laughs> bit of a thing I had running through my act for a period of time. I don't really do it anymore, but someone will come up to me in a mall or a parking lot. Hey, fucky. You know, and I got my 10 year old there. I'm like, <laughs> come on, dude. Like, look around. We're not in a comedy club. And, and, and you can't really be like hey that wasn't me because you know yeah they they you, know you they are know. you look who you are yeah pretty recognizable yeah you know yeah. people they see my face and they go you know yeah it's, it's the old <laughs> thing of they can't figure out where they know me from but they know to be scared yeah <laughs> not so scared that they won't come up to you in the mall though no no not that scared because yeah. there's people around you take your kids to church though don't you uh, I haven't in years. I did for an, a few years because they went to Catholic school. Um, uh, yeah, but, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, they're no longer in Catholic school. Let's just say that. <laughs> they got kicked out. They got kicked out. When they saw yeah. their dad's uh, yeah. performance. And and since not going to Catholic school, that's why I did for about three years the material that's on my new album about Catholics and the Catholic school system and all that. Because now I'm like, okay, now they can't get into trouble. But for a while, people did recognize me at the Catholic Church, and they kind of eyed me. And I think, you know, I didn't want to get my kids involved, so I kind of pulled back from some of that material for a while. It, it's not. I hope it's not just me, but it's ridiculous that there's a public Catholic school system in a province. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Okay, good. Is there Over- also a private Catholic school system? Mm, there, I mean, there's private schools. It can be Catholic or not. Yeah, Catholic. there's private okay. for sure. But yeah, that's crazy. But I don't believe that there should be both. I don't believe, I believe, if you believe in religion, fine, keep it at home. It should be separate from any kind of government money. That's my attitude about it. But I mean, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. I, I sent my kids to Catholic <laughs> school for eight to 10 years. So, yeah, they're I mean, better schools. What do you expect? Yeah, right? Their math grades are better now. So that's all that matters. <laughs> do you think that uh, churches should be tax exempt? No, absolutely not. Uh, no one should be tax exempt. Other than charities, charities, certain charities, I understand why they they can be tax exempt, but you know, the background of the Catholic church isn't (laughs) so much charitable in my, in my No, they still have to pay for all the ill they do in my book. Yeah. Yeah. Guy, what do you think? Charitable status of religious institutions? Don't ask for my opinion, Sam. (laughs) Good Lord. I ask the questions on this show. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Me. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't have a strong opinion on it, but no, they shouldn't get uh, tax breaks. No. Taxes are good. They help society. Well, if we didn't have taxes, how would people be getting their serve money every month? Yeah. How do you think that's impacting uh, comedians? Well, it's like the old joke. Some comics are like, yoo-hoo, a raise. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Especially Canadians. Yeah. Such a Canadian thing. <laughs> I'm going to get money for four months in a row during the summer? Oh, my God. You're right. Awesome. It is like the best timing for, sure. for a comic. <laughs> Comedy in the summer sucks. And it's like, oh my God, two grand in a month in the summer? Like, there's headliners that don't make that. Yeah. Oh, God. Ah, <laughs> uh, Canadian comedy. You got to love it. Well, hey, you know. Have you done uh, much performing outside of Canada? I've done a little bit. I've done America. Uh, I moved down to Los Angeles in 99 to try to make it. And uh, did that happen? It didn't happen. Did not happen. It did not happen. It was uh, terrible. I just was. I was just spending Canadian money at American prices, you know. And uh, so my money ran out. 
And then I drove back to Vancouver and I drove across the country by touring. I've performed in England. I've performed in Australia a little bit, but once my kids came along and the health conditions, which I've talked about on past episodes, I was pretty Mm -hmm. much landlocked to Canada and I'm okay with that. I mean, there was a time where I wished my parents fucked in America so I could have a green card. And now I just wish they fucked in Montreal so I could speak French and make the real money in comedy. (laughs) (laughs) You talk about Mr. Ward on your album yeah, right off the top there. Yep. And why do you think there's such a difference between French language Canadian comedy and English? Because like, the and French, money. the French and the Aboriginal in this country do something that we all mock them for. And I don't agree with it. I never have. I've never been one of these comics like Fuck Quebec. They support their own. You look at any artist that's one of theirs, they support them. When is yeah. you look at us, the I hate to say it, the other co- comics in this country, we're competing with Americans, we're competing with the Brits for comedy and places and things like that and time. If you're French or Aboriginal, you don't have to have the same fights within your own group. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying the world. Of course, they're held back in certain ways, but at least they support their own. So when you have someone like Mike Ward, who's a star in Quebec, mm-hmm. and he's selling hundreds of thousands of DVDs, that case where he's got to spend 60 grand means nothing to him. Oh, it's an investment. Average, yeah, of course it is because of all the press he got. Yeah. Now, a Canadian comic, 60 grand, that's, you know, two or three years of, of touring the whole goddamn country. Yeah. That's what that is. They can't afford it. No, and it wouldn't go over as well, probably. No, it wouldn't. Oh. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I remember this is a long time ago. I sent, I had a clip that I was in trouble for about the Winnipeg bus beheading. And uh, like newspapers across Canada called me evil. I sent the clip to JFL and they said they didn't like it. They thought it was terrible. They thought it was bad. And I'm like, okay, fine. But then when Mike Ward did some things, jokes that were just as offensive, if not even considered to be more offensive, they were like championing the cause. You know, they always brag about Bill Hicks. We never censored Bill Hicks. Well, you censored me. So, you know. That's funny. I know we have talked about your beheading bit before and I saw it. And it took the right side. Right. So what, what is there? Why is this in bad taste other than the fact that you're mentioning it? But I mean, you weren't, you weren't uh, championing it. No, of course not. I wouldn't say, Hey, that guy got what he deserved and blah, blah, blah. It wasn't that at all. But you know, at that time, this is well, but this is years ago. This is before there was the whole social media storm or any of that. It just was someone who was talking about something that people, for the most part, thought you couldn't make fun of. And at that time, newspapers wrote about it. That's like in Canada. It's like the classic Canada versus America. America embraces controversy. Canada shies away from it. They don't want anything to do with it unless America loves you. Then they're all over it. Louis C.K., just for laughs. I rest my case. (laughs) Did you see his new special? No, I have no interest, really. No, no, uh, because of uh, just in general, you never liked him or I, I loved, because I of the stuff. controversy. I loved this stuff for a long time, but there was a period of time where it's like I watch him and then I kind of figured out how he did his jokes. And so then it doesn't have the same kind of oomph. And uh, so I, well before the controversy, I kind of stopped following what he was doing. I'd watch clips. Huh. Not, I think he's funny, you know, mm-hmm. but I don't yeah. have really want to invest an hour to hour and a half to watch him personally. Nothing personal. I also don't know if he did enough when he came back personally, but that's, that's, you know, everyone's line is different there. I don't think he did enough, so I'm not going to support him and pay for a ticket. If you think he did, that's fine. That's your line. It's tough uh, being a professional when you hear other people. And then as you say, you figured out how, how he does it because right. you can analyze this. Are there comics out there that you still really love and you just can't figure out? And so that keeps you coming back to them. Yeah, I mean, I still, the the way that certain people's brains work, I mean, I'm not a clean comic, so I still love watching stuff, and obviously everyone always talks about Brian Regan or the Gaffigans. Mm. I still love Kenny, because Kenny's still doing something I don't do, and I still haven't figured it out, and I've toured the most with Kenny uh, Robinson of any comic in this country or around the world. I've seen him the most. And, you know, there was comics like Otto and George. If if you're a fan of comedy <laughs> and dirty comedy, you definitely should check someone hit like him out. He's passed away, rest in peace, but he was a great comic. And a lunatic. Yes, of course. Yeah. Of course he yeah. was. Oh, it was yeah. amazing. Did did you share the stage with Sam Kinison? I did not, but Kenny did. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you but you saw him at Yuck Yuck's 
back I, in the day? No, no, I never did. No, I didn't. But by oh, the okay. time that I was around, he was not even appearing in Canada or anything like that. And then he passed away shortly after. Mm. Same thing with Hicks. I never saw him live, but Kenny mm. did. And uh, lots of comics saw him in Toronto when he came up one of his last tours. And, and they, I mean, Kenny uh, had good things to say. Yeah, I about mean, them. Yeah, he yeah. loved he loved Sam Kinison. In fact, me and Kenny would get into fights about it because I'm not a huge Kinison fan. Mm. Even though people would be like, "What you scream <laughs> and yell and jump around?" What's the... you know? I liked some of his stuff, but I didn't like the misogyny and I didn't like the gay bashing jokes. I just didn't. Even when I was 16, I didn't like it. I just yeah. felt uncomfortable. But anytime he talked about religion, he was on point, and it was great because that's something he grew up with in and he knew a lot about. So it's like he at least took angles that hadn't been done before. Where some of the misogynist and rock star gay bashing stuff, I wasn't a fan of. So me and Kenny would, you know, kind of argue a bit about that. He's like, "Oh, you didn't see him live. He was, he was amazing." I'm like, "I'm sure he was, but you know, to me, it's always what they're saying. It's like why well, I'm not a big fan of crowd work. Crowd work. If you like crowd work, great. But I want to see your thoughts. I'm there to see something. I don't care how the front couple fuck or why they're together or why they're not together or they're fighting. I, I don't care about it personally." Mm -hmm. Do you like a host who does crowd work or no? I'm fine with that because yeah. that's kind of setting a bit of a tone and it's kind of like the host is the, you know, the, the party host. So he can do that or she can do that. That's fine. But uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not a fan of it when it's the headliner doing it. Not a fan of found comedy. You want it to be uh, thought about. Yeah. Like there's this thing in, in like, you know, alt comedy where there's a character of like, I don't care about what I'm doing up here. I barely want to even be here. And my attitude has always been like, I'm coming prepared and I'm coming to bring things. I care about being here. I may not care so much about your reaction at, in the moment. If you don't like it, tough shit, but I'm prepared and I care. I understand why the alt character works if I don't care, but I'm not a fan of it because I want to hear things. I want to see, I, I guess it's passion or whatever it is. That's what I'm into. That's what still gets me off. And that's why the, you know, someone like Kenny, I still love watching. I don't care. I don't care. Who who is that comic? Um, that who is was, that? Oh, he's not, I don't care. I don't care. Oh, he passed away. Yes, uh, he did from in did. Florida. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, remember. funny guy. Sorry. Amazing comic. Yeah. Very funny. Yeah. You you were here last year shooting something. Is that right? I shot a commercial for TD yeah. Bank, who then I got cut out of, but they still had to pay me. Damn right they did. And Damn straight. Those are the best ones, aren't they? <laughs> I'm sure they are. They're the greatest. <laughs> I don't think somebody did their job, to be honest. I think that's what happened. They didn't know who I was. They kind of dropped the ball. Then they may have brought me on set. Then they Googled me, whatever, because yeah. they found that I was a comic. And then they're like, okay, let's get rid of this. I thought they were hiring Darren Rose. Hey, <laughs> go for it, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you were here, it was uh, a perfect example of what you just mentioned there, coming prepared. You, you dropped yep. into the amateur night, and it was just mm -hmm. like you had a plan. You stuck to the plan. You executed the plan. Did great. Right. That's it. You're a pro. And right. it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit tough, uh, with that character of, I don't care. Um, if the audience isn't on board. Yes. Like, and when, and when the moment, like, especially it's hard to do if you're new, right. Cause mm -hmm. the audience has no reason to trust you that you're going to be funny. Right. So like you get in that, if you start with that habit of, I don't care, you're never going to have people give a shit about it. Right. I mean, yeah. it's a fine, it's a fine line and I understand when some of them can do it and someone like Chris Locke can do it and Jeff Paul can do it, but sure. I, it's, it's, they do it well, but you know, even someone like Jeff Paul, who I've seen over the years, he's, his characters kind of switched from the, so much of the, I don't care to the world fucked who cares. And there's a big difference. Oh, huge. In that. And so the last couple of times I saw him, he's, you know, I always thought he was funny. Don't get me wrong. But that I don't care character kind of turns me off a bit, but he's kind of switched it a little. And now it's, he's killing way harder. Mm -hmm. um, maybe he's a little more confident, but the character is just slightly different. And, you know, he's not, he's not performing for me. He's performing for the audience. That's all that mm -hmm. matters. But I know what I like and that's what I like. Hey, by the way, Kevin Meany is the comedian mm -hmm. we were Absolutely. thinking of. Uh Kevin Meany, he had a great set on The Tonight Show. His first uh, ever appearance on it got called over to Johnny. It was I saw that live, like on TV while I was watching it late yeah, yeah. at night. Yep. <laughs> yes, we're big parent people. That's right, yep. You'll poke right, your eye that... out. That was his other line. That's what he opened with, right? With <laughs> yeah, the, the, yep. the 
taking the mic out of the stand. Yeah. Oh man, what a classic. <laughs> I and then later on in his life, I think the last special he had uh, was it was he recorded it in a club. It wasn't yes. huge, and yep. but it was hilarious. Yeah, I think it's the funny. funniest stuff he ever did. Very funny, but I think his problem uh, is that he was gay and he came out, and I think a lot of his fans didn't know that about him, and I think he was kind of worried about that, and yeah. he kind of came out in a time where it wasn't as, you know, as celebrated kind of thing, and so maybe he kind of fell through the cracks a little bit. I don't. And age is a factor too. I mean, you know, a lot of that that era of comics. Like I just went down to L.A. in the summer. And it was a, one of the best nights of comedy I ever saw, believe it or not. It was um, Larry Miller. Um, Former guest on this program, Larry Miller. Yeah, okay. Jay Leno and um, Jimmy Brogan. At the Comedy and Magic Club on a Sunday night? Yes. Yeah, one of the best shows I've ever seen. <laughs> and I, you remember I told you I hate crowd work? All Jimmy Brogan did was crowd work, and it was the, one of the funniest things I ever saw. Oh, he's, mm. he's so good. Because it wasn't just, hey, how do you fuck? Hey, what do you do? It was, what do you do? But then he took some something with it and went farther and way smarter with it. So I was really impressed. And it was great to see Larry Miller. All three of those comics were bucket list comics for me. And I saw them all in one night for 20 mm. bucks. <laughs> I got to say, when I saw Jay Leto at, uh, I think it was the Orpheum here, big, big theater, he did crowd work. Right. <clears throat> probably no more than five minutes. And it was the worst crowd work I've ever right. seen in my life. Right. Cause he, he went down the line. You, sir, what's your name? What do you do? Boom. One Rolodex joke right yep. to the next person. Like, no, no interaction with the person. It's just, what do you do? Oh, thank, what do you do? Uh, right. What do you do? <laughs> it was, it was terrible. And and that's Sam's favorite comic. One of them. I have my signed first edition of uh, leading with my chin on my bookshelf oh, yeah. over here. A lot of people don't give Jay Leno enough credit. I mean, before he had the Tonight Show, he was the best comic in America. Oh yeah, Bar he none. was great. Bar none, yeah, it was like was a, great. it was unbelievable. And I get it; he kind of became the corporate man, you know, the working for the man and all that, pumping the hands of all the stations, mm -hmm. and took it from Letterman. But you know what? Until you're in that beast, you don't know what the fuck's going on. So I yeah. try not to, you know, it's like comics that go after Carrot Top. Give me a break. That guy pays his openers well, treats them well. He knows it's hard to have to open for Carrot Top. He, and that's what I look at. I look at how do people treat other people? You yeah. know, whether their act is great or not. When I hear a story about a certain star paying someone only 100 bucks to open for 3,000 people, I want to kill that guy. You know, I just like verbally destroy him because it's like, you remember what it was like when you're first starting out. Oh, yeah, it's it's the worst. You want to feel like you matter, and right. uh, yeah, if the person you're working with treats you like shit, then there's nothing worse. No, there's a story about um the oh, what's his name the the big uh, the the really heavy comic John Panette. Yeah. So John Panette, I won't tell the name of the comic, but he's a well some somewhat well known Canadian comic, and he has to open for John Panette for a JFL tour. And after the show or after a set, I'm not sure if it's during the intermission or after the show, John Panette comes in the green room, shakes his hand, says, great job. Are they treating you good? Are they treating you all right? You're treating you? And the comments like, yeah, everything's fine. Everything's great. Well, I want to really thank, thanks a lot. You know, shakes his hand. There's like 500 bucks in his hand. Wow. Hmm. You know, <laughs> like to him, 500 bucks, because he's making probably, you know, 50 grand for that night or whatever is yeah. nothing. But I'll tell you, I tell that story whenever I can to any comic that either, you know, throws him under the bus or just calls him that, you know, fat guy comic or whatever. First of all, he was more than that. And That's more hilarious. importantly, he treated comics with respect and he knew how hard it was because you're opening for someone that like I've opened for Russell Peters. It's not easy. Everyone's no. just laughing, going, where's Russell? <laughs> That's all they're doing. They're laughing, but they're kind of laughing. Where's Russell? That's all that matters. And I've talked exclusively to guys who've opened for Russell and they know that, but they're just there to enjoy the moment, play to a big crowd. And if they get some bucks, they get some bucks. Well, Ru think? Russell treats people well, doesn't he? Extremely well. Yeah. Extremely well. And by the way, when I, when I mentioned Jay Leno's crowd work, that was not to throw him under the bus or to pile on. No, it I was, no. it was really it good. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the worst crowd work I've ever seen on an otherwise fine show. So, uh, and then just the fact that you saw him on a night, Jimmy Brogan was doing crowd work that yes. you actually liked and you don't like crowd work. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. was really, really great. And, you know, I wish I could 
I, I wanted to meet them, of course, maybe get a photo, the cheesy thing, but that couldn't happen. But, you know, a couple of days later, I sent Brogan a message just saying, look, I'm a comic of 30 years. And that was amazing. And he answered it and he said something back. It was nice. And that's all that mattered to me at that point. I can say, hey, at least he knew that I saw it and I liked it. So. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, there are exceptions to things that we like and we don't like of crowd course. work, silly comedy. Like you say, the reason you don't like crowd work is because you want to hear a comic's thoughts, what they have thought about and and can uh, express to the yes. audience yes. and impart on the audience. And yet somebody doing I don't care or we're big pant people like you can like that, even though it's silly and it's not important and it's you know, it's his thought, but yes. not a deep thought for no, sure. No, but I mean, for me, like I don't watch Marvel movies. I watch documentaries. I don't watch a lot of yeah. Hollywood films. I literally watch documentaries, true crime, all that stuff. That, that's what I'm generally watching all the time. Cause that's what, you know, I like. So I apply that, you know, my music, I listen to bands like midnight oil and the indigo girls bands that have a meaning and are important and things like to me. So you know, it makes sense that I kind of gravitate towards those kind of comics, but that doesn't mean I don't like, you know, uh, a, a band that isn't always that. There's always the side road to sometimes I, I, you know, I just want to dance around and listen to Brian Adams in my underwear, you know. Absolutely. There are very few professionals that almost anything I don't respect for becoming professionals. You know. Yeah, they put think, the work in for sure. Yeah, and when it comes to comedy, like I'm not a a carrot top fan of his but i respect the shit out of him for making it right for yeah, doing his yeah. thing his live show is apparently great oh yes, I've, yeah. I've heard that Vegas. too yeah yeah but there's but even it's, yeah it's, it's like people who don't respect magicians or they don't like improv artists or whatever you know any any good entertainment is hard yeah you know it's a classic dirty comic versus clean it's not one is not better just being good in that genre is hard and being, you know, a good magician is hard. And being a good prop act is hard. And, you know, that, that that's just the way it is. And I respect anyone that gets up there and tries. And it does nothing always be for me. As long as they act reasonable offstage, the worst thing for me is watching a guy who's silly or whatever and then walking off and thinking they're Bill Hicks. And I've seen it, trust me. <laughs> they think they're reinvented comedy or yeah. they've done something nobody's ever done. Really, you did the arms game. You know, like, give me a break. You know, I've seen it a hundred times. It works great, but you're not reinventing comedy. And I haven't seen it as much as I, in the, in the late nineties. Oh my God. I saw it so much people thinking they're reinventing comedy. It was crazy. And what's the arms game, Dan? That's an improv game where the improv artist stands uh -huh. and then the person puts his arms in between. And then that person talks and they've got to act out with their arms. Wait, people fucking do this and, and oh, yeah, of course. pass it off as groundbreaking comedy. Well, they would do something like that and then walk <laughs> no, off I and don't. then think that, yeah. you know, you know like, well, this is an improv. This is improv, yes. Sam. Oh, okay. and it is yeah. like the the most overdone yes, uh, thing. improv game. So my yeah. head space was in like imagining Yuck Yucks, a comic coming up, uh, you know, doing a guest spot on a weekend and then doing this game. So my headspace was in the wrong one for that. That's why they yeah, but I mean, like, for example, someone going up, like, I can get 10 applause breaks by just making statements, right? So oh, you yeah. do an eight-minute set and go, Canadians, aren't we the best country in the world? Ooh, clap, clap, clap. American beer tastes like piss. Blah, 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 clap. You know, you can do eight of those in a row, get yeah. a ton of applause breaks, be the star of the show because the audience is dumb, and they walk off and they think, well, why aren't I booked here all the time? I'm the best guy on this show. Well, you're not the best guy on this show. <laughs> Tonight you were because this crowd might be dumb or drunk or whatever. But, you know, I, there's been tons of times I've seen it where great comics couldn't follow middles, but they weren't great middles. They were just cheerleader middles or trick middles or doing something outside of the rules in the time. And they think they're amazing and they're not. Yeah. And then they become headliners and they can't do it because being a middle and a headliner is a completely different thing. What's the difference? Well, first of all, it's the difference is in time. Mm -hmm. You think it's only 45 minutes. It's not. You have to have at least 90 minutes of really good material because you're going on at the hour mark. So an hour of comedy is going on before you. So that means jokes that may have been done or topics are now been touched. You can't do. Uh, so that can shit can maybe half an hour of your act right there. Mm -hmm. Also, based on what kind of comedy has gone on before you also affects the mood and style of how you have to do it. 
Because if your middle is some kind of really super loud comic and you're not, you're in trouble. You're going to have to rearrange it a bit, slow it down, build your own pace, stamp your own character. It's yeah. not easy. These are all things that people just think, oh, it's just 15 more minutes. It's not. No. Hey, Darren, it's time for another cold read down at the bottom okay. of the page. Let me get the glasses on. Cold read time. Okay. This is Darren Frost, fuckies, and you're listening to What's So Funny with Guy and Sam on CFRO 100.5 FM, Vancouver Co-op Radio, your isolation station in this nation, motherfuckers. Oh, nice. All right. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> All right, uh, Darren, uh, you know, thank God you have brought back Anything Goes, a podcast, because the world needs more podcasts yeah, I know. now. I know. <laughs> no, but you like when did you guys start originally start anything goes we started i think about eight or nine years ago we ran for three years uh and then the show stopped uh it was on xm radio for years and then it just wasn't working out and uh we stopped we did one episode just kind of in limbo only because steve pearl was in town and steve pearl doesn't come to toronto very much so we're like we gotta lock him down this guy is amazing so we did a one-off episode, I think, about four years ago. Did you and, get a word in? Well, no, but that's the greatness of <laughs> uh, of Steve Pearl. Steve Pearl, yeah. Have you had Steve Pearl on the show? Have not. Mark Dennison, the late Mark Dennison, tried to uh, arrange that, and I I didn't want to do it remotely. Right. But I said, for sure, if he comes to town, absolutely. Yeah. But now, hey, maybe we'll do it this way. Yeah. No, now nothing is in person. Yeah, he's amazing. So we did it just a one-off. And then, you know, I moved away from Toronto and it's like, you know, having to go into the city to do it, I just didn't want it. Now with this pandemic and the electronics have kind of caught up and the ability to do it and do it well and not sounding terrible. So we started talking about it. And, you know, we'll see where it goes. Whether we go 100 episodes or do five episodes and say it's enough, I, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I'm just happy to be back with Kathleen and Dave. I thought the show was the best with the three of us. And we'll see where it goes. This is Kathleen McGee and Dave Martin. And Kathleen, of course, has few podcasts already. Yes. But they're not the same. They're not the same. Because, no. you know, it's it's all about the energy of the three people and what we bring. And I bring up a topic that she would never bring up on her podcast or other shows. And, and Dave does as well. So, you know, it, she works so well just in the moment. That's what Kathleen's specialty is. I'm not saying she's not a planner, but she, her the way her mind works in the moment of that discussion, she says some really funny things that I or Dave would never say. So that's why it's great. Yeah, and she's in Edmonton. Dave is in Toronto. Yes, in Toronto, and I'm in. And Barry. you're in Barrie. Yeah. yeah, and so you recorded your first one. We recorded did it last night. How did it go? It it went well, but it's we're still having some technical issues just uploading it. So hopefully it'll be up by tomorrow, being Wednesday, uh, the beginning of uh, the middle of May or whatever we are now. I, I don't even know what the date is. What is the date? It's May twelfth. May twelfth today, oh, as yeah. we record. Yeah, May twelfth. So May thirteenth. Hopefully it's up out there and. We uh, have a few people lined up for guests in the upcoming weeks, and and we'll see what happens. That's great, and and the name is such a perfect name for Darren Frost yes. vehicle. Yeah, it was going to be called that or the Bottom Line because I used to say that way too much. Well, the Bottom Line is the Bottom Line is, and I'm glad I chose mm -hmm. Anything Goes. And now there's like ten, there's ten other shows called that Anything Goes now. So it's oh really? Like, oh yeah, there's tons. Yeah. Oh well, you know, in olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked upon as something shocking. Right. But now, God knows, anything goes. That's right. Of course, you know the reference. Yeah. And was that in one of your top 10 albums from when you were 13 and <laughs> when I was listening 13. to 47 year old albums? This was a uh, Cole Porter tune. Anything yeah. goes. Great yeah. lyrics. Yeah. S.J. Perelman, I think, wrote the lyrics. A great uh, comedic writer. In your top 10 albums, was any of those albums released in this century? Uh, absolutely not. But here's the thing, Darren, like you, I was a little sick of seeing these peop oh. people accepting challenges. Oh. And I had written just before that, hey, folks, you don't need to wait for a challenge to post and you yeah. post whatever you want on yeah. your Facebook page. And if you do accept it, you don't need to abide by the rules no. and say no comment on this or I have to have 10. So I don't think I posted 10. I have a few on there, uh, none from even this century. 
So, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I did it. I did it once for the top 10 albums, but I also didn't do it. I just did like two days. And the last day I just put the rest up because I'm like, I'm tired of this. And then it just snowballed. Everybody was doing it to the point where it's like, I hate it so much. That's why I'm doing the ones I'm doing. You know, top yeah. 10 floors in my house, top Those 10, are great. you know, parts of my body. And, you know, someone's already messaged me, please stop the parts of your body. It's disgusting. I'm like, well, then stop the top 10s. <laughs> <laughs> what number are you at for parts of your body? I'm at number five for body, seven for floors, and oh. five for uh, pictures of my face while watching my favorite movies. <laughs> and and are you really taking those photos while you're watching your movies? No, that's what I want to no, know. No, absolutely oh. not. So this is a farce. Dear. It's always a farce. It's a farce. Yeah. Uh so yes, the po- the podcast people can. I guess the old ones are still available. Hey, I mean, there's a podcast world. They're out there. They're out people there, but they're still not. Tune in. It's, yeah, it's hard to find for some reason. We weren't that smart back in the day, like you and and keeping the same provider and all that so there's a hundred episodes and you know to be honest there's about 10 good ones and uh the the one that is still the best and uh, as far as i'm concerned is the one with ron james the one with ron james and then mike mcdonald and john wing they're the kind of top three that we had and all three are veterans and they knew what they're doing but the ron james one is just great because he really goes after just for laughs and we didn't think he would the way he would but he just goes after them and it was great to see <laughs> oh, so that's why you liked it well, he, 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 you know, he pulls no punches. He says what's actually happening and they haven't changed in the, that was eight years ago. They're still the same way. And Ron James doesn't play just for laughs clearly no, as you don't. No, no, he doesn't. And yeah. you know, he's got no, he's made his own life. He's, he plays out theaters, you know, the bigger size ones than they actually do on their tours. So what does he, what does he care? He can be honest about it. Uh, it's funny. Those three that you mentioned solid pros. And I've found over my 15 years doing this show they're often, I mean, there are exceptions on both sides, but the best guests, those solid pros who just know how to tell a story, know how to be slightly on when they're talking, right? <laughs> uh, but but not doing shtick the whole time, but right. still engaging and funny. Yeah. So the three years I did the show at XM, me and Dave would always make the statement, whenever a Canadian comic came on and they weren't like a veteran or like those kinds of guys, it was hard to be getting anything out of them. But anytime we had an American on, they were on and they treated like this was the Carson show. No matter every single time an American came on, they were on. They had something funny to say, thoughts planned out, boom. And it was great, quick and concise. And believe it or not, some of my best friends in comedy came on my show and just laid an egg because they're just like, well, I'm here. And it's not about I'm just here. You've got to bring something. You know, you have to bring Mm. your personality to a show. Otherwise, you're not filling the hour. You know, it's just not happening. And the number of Canadians that don't know how to play that game is mm. shocking. Do you think that's because there's not much of an industry around having to promote yourself as much in Canada? I think that's one of them. I think the yeah. second thing is people are lazy and they think that their their thoughts are good enough. You know, I've been doing this 30 years. I still planned on some of the things that I was going to say tonight. I still did some research. I mm. still looked up things in the news in case something comes up. I'm still doing that just for this. But they wouldn't do just that. for this. Well, yeah, I'm just yeah, saying. but I, I would say I, I know what you're saying. I would say I was thinking that perhaps it was more that they were friends of yours. They knew you. Sure. And so they're more relaxed sure. and they don't have that nervous energy or right. and, and a, an American comedian coming on, even though it's not, uh, you know, the Tonight Show that they're doing. It's still something that they don't know. Like, how big is this? How, how Who's listening? This right. this could be huge in Canada. I don't know. Right. And they, their attitude is always, if I even get just three fans out of this, it's worth my hour. Whereas that's mm. drilled into Americans so much that it's like, I just got, if I get three fans today, three fans tomorrow, three fans the next day, three. It's changed a little bit now with social media, but back then it just wasn't the same game. That grind and hustle of trying to get fans wasn't the same. There was a couple comics, comics like Tricks and a few others that were doing that. And of course, now we see that, you know, the proof is he's successful doing what he does because he did all that groundwork. It's it's good though. The the three that you that stood out to you guests were all Canadian. Mike McDonald, John Wing, and Ron James. Yes, and I, not to toot my own horn, but I also wasn't worried about asking questions that I thought had to be asked to all three of them. So me and John Wing actually got into a bit of, not an argument, but a real discussion on, you know, craft versus the art of stand-up. He thought it was a craft, I thought it was an art form, and we got into it a bit. 
Uh, Mike McDonald, I'd asked him some of the stories about him not being such a nice guy, whereas other people might have been a little worried to ask that. And then me bringing up just for last with, with uh, you know, Ron James, just going for it. You know, so we were lucky in that regard. And they all had great answers. You have a journalist's uh, mindset where feel free to ask any question. They don't have to answer it, but you got to ask it. Yeah. And if they, you know, if they don't like it, we can either, you know, shit can that part and edit it out or whatever. Mm -hmm. They can say, let's stop for a second. Can we talk? Yeah, fine. Because we never Mm -hmm. went, we didn't always go live with some of these interviews. Like all three of those interviews were not live. They were taped because of, they were all on different schedules. So we had the ability to cut something out. We said that kind of off the top, but we didn't have to because they know how to frame a question. Even if a question they don't want to answer, they know how to frame the answer. So it doesn't make them look like an asshole, but they still don't want to answer it. Exactly. (laughs) So you don't need to be afraid to ask questions, young podcasters out there. Just ask them and, you know, they'll skillfully avoid the question. Nobody's going to get flummoxed and start to cry. I'm sorry, but if, 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 you know, nobody Darren Frost in Toronto is asking you a question you get that pissed off about, you got to really start evaluating where you are in your career. (laughs) As uh, Sam mentioned in the intro, uh, your seventh album is now out called yes. Story Yelling. Yes. Where does it rank among the seventh? Seven. Uh, I would probably say it's, you know, third on my list of my albums in terms of quality. <laughs> That's a good, honest answer. Yeah, it's, it's not my best. It's not yeah. my best. It's just another hour. Did you record that in, was it one uninterrupted recording? Or was it so recorded record over the whole it, weekend? I, I record everything all the time. I have my own rig. So what happened is I recorded one whole show and then only one, one minute clip in the second show I used because there was a bit of a technical problem with the microphone. So I had to put that in, but that's it. So for the most part, it's one complete show. I don't like doing the whole cutting in and getting, Oh, that sounds great. And let's put that. It's like one whole, you pay, you, you see one show. My first DVD was a pro camera, Pro consumer camera locked off one angle. That was my first DVD. There was no camera trickery. It started when the show started. It ended when I walked off the stage, and that was it. Uh, when you talk about uh, subjects like we talked about earlier, driving your van into the river or sure. uh, suicide, jumping in front of a train, yep. um, these are obviously just the dark thoughts that some people have. Right. But is it therapeutic for you? Is it cathartic to... Uh, to- to get out on stage or you ever worry about how people will take things it is therapeutic of course um there's one bit on my album it took me 15 years to get it right they're literally that story is like 16 years old um and it's taken me 15 years and countless times of kenny robinson telling me drop that bit it's not funny enough it's not it just pisses audiences off but I'm like, no, I'm going to keep doing this bit. So I would do it on like off nights or open mics or whatever, and just keep grinding it out till I got it to a level because I wanted to show that I could make this work. So which bit was that? That's the story about the baby, the baby who gets uh, assaulted by a dog. Let's just put it that way. Okay. Yeah. It's a pretty hard story. Has Kenny Robinson heard the latest version? Did he go, Hey, by God, you got it. He did. I didn't think you could. He did. And you know what? It's only a seven out of 10, the bit, and it's a long bit. It's 10 minutes long, I think on the album, but it's a seven out of 10. And I work my ass off to get it to seven out of 10. Not everyone is going to laugh at a story where a baby dies. Let's just put it that way. Not everyone. No. No. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I did what I wanted to do. It is therapeutic. It is. If my old store, my old kind of line was, if you don't laugh at this, I went through it for nothing. So the three stories in that bit about, you know, on that album, they're all things that actually happened to me. They happened to me in the last couple of years. They're horrible things. And, you know, at the end of it, of each of those things, I said, I better get a bit out of this or I went through it for <laughs> nothing. So, you know, mm. it, it benefits me. And I don't think if it's not my best album, uh, great sales pitch, I understand that. But if you like my comedy and you've bought anything I've ever done before, you will like the album. Whether you love it or not, that's on you. But, you know, it goes on my box set. And now my box set is like, you know, 40 hours long. And that's the way it is. Well, I can't remember the first time I saw you, but I think you're just getting better each year, each time I see you. I think I'm getting becoming more comfortable and I'm not trying to trick anyone with the jumping around anger as much as I used to. And I'm picking my places. And I think that comes with age. And 
I'm, I'm fine with that. I personally, I don't think I'm as funny as I was 10 years ago, but you know, I'm still doing a good job. Well, it's funny because like Sam mentioned, when you performed at Yuck Yucks, you hear filming a commercial. Yeah. And it's just great to see, you know, a real pro get on stage. I don't know. What did you do? Five, 10 minutes yeah, or like something? Yeah, like six minutes or something. Yeah. yeah. And, th- and that was a, a night where they had a wide range of, of comics on stage. But man, when you hit the stage, you go, that's a, that's a professional. Yeah. And you know what? I, when, I, when, when I did that week, I was there for four nights and I did seven shows. It's not a, not a bad town. So, in November? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah, I did seven different shows. I, you know, I got to finally see Glenn Wool for the first time live as a headliner, and that was just great. Um, I got to see one of the last shows Kathleen McGee did um, out in uh, Kitsilina Beach at the club, which is now Ricky Bronson's club, but back then it wasn't. Uh, it was Laugh Lines. So, I mean, it was a, it was a great four days. I've always loved Vancouver. I've always said the great thing about Vancouver is, you know, the the, the comedy there. Not that so much the headliners. The headliners are great, whatever. But the young comics each time I go there is just getting better and better. And that's not me kissing ass because I don't go there that often. I don't really give a fuck. But the comedy there is great. It has been for the last 10 years. Only problem with, with Vancouver is there's only so many headliners that can really make a living at it. And mm-hmm. you got to wait for one of them to either die or move or quit. And then you can maybe make some money. <laughs> then, you, then you can move up. Yeah. My turn. You know, someone's got to kill Ivan Decker. That's all. That's all they got to do. <laughs> He's moved to L.A. We're okay. Oh, has he? Oh, good for Half him. Half a headliner spot opened up. Oh, good for him. <laughs> hey, Darren, do you have uh, siblings? I do. I have two sisters. Yep. And, and like, I know your wife and your kids, mm-hmm. they they support your comedy. Do your, Does your family, like your sisters and parents? Um, I don't know if support is a good word. Um, I think they're okay with it. I think like when I did my comedy now, so many years ago, I, I said in my comedy now that I have a dysfunctional family and I, and that was a thing that almost like broke my mother's heart. It's like, she couldn't believe I said that. And I'm like, I don't think you should come and see me anymore. If you're worried about that, <laughs> but that's the thing that makes you go like, you know, disown me. We're in trouble. Uh, I think they tolerate it. Uh, you know, my wife, I think my wife tolerates it. She understands. I was a comic before she met me. So she signed up for it, but do they love it? I don't know. What do your sisters do? Uh, my one sister uh, works as a kind of like a, a maid for houses. And then the other one works at crash reporting centers, like for the police stations. So she runs a hmm. bunch of them. So they're both, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, in their own lives. And I mean, they come and see me every once in a while, but not, not that much. And I kind of like it that way. They come and see you. And then at the end, they just shake their head. Oh, Darren. Well, you know why? Yeah. Why must you? Yeah. <laughs> You know, and then I try to tell stories. One time I did a show in my hometown, Brantford, and it turned out to be, you know, everyone says, oh, we're going to come, we're going to come. It ended up being 24 people and 21 were my family. So I had to do the show. I had to do an hour uh, in front of my family. So I just told horrible, (laughs) horrible stories about my family. And that was the last time they all have seen me. And that was probably 10, 8, 10 years ago. (laughs) That's awesome. Like we could have just gone home and I could have told you these stories. Oh yeah, exactly. We could have just sat around a campfire and I could have, Talked about the day my mom maybe wore dresses and danced with my sister's boyfriend. You know, stories. <laughs> hey, we got to get running. But who were you in in Hairspray? I was the cameraman that got Michelle Pfeiffer fired. So I had scenes with Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, I had ooh. scenes with uh, Travolta. I had scenes with uh, Christopher Walken. And I had lunch with a guy, Paul Dooley, who's a very accomplished character actor. He's a... Uh, was in Breaking Away, he's on Curb Your Enthusiasm, and he had such great stories because he was a doorman at comedy clubs when Lenny Bruce was in New York. So oh, I had wow. lunch with him like three or four times, just telling me these great stories about comedy in the 70s in New York. And That is funny. That Yeah, that's that's amazing. But yeah. w- when I saw that you were in Hairspray, I go, well, I wonder who he was. And as soon as you said I was a cameraman, I go, of course I remember that. Yeah. I remember going, oh, Darren's in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah. And was that recorded in Toronto or was that when you were down in L.A.? That was in Toronto. Yep. Hmm. And, you know, it's funny. When I first got the role, I, w- I had a much bigger part. and It was like a reoccurring joke the whole way through. So it was like a big deal. And I had like 22 days on set. So that's a lot for a movie. 
and uh, you know, my agent's excited and everyone's great. And oh yeah. Yeah. And then day one, I get a phone call and they're like, yeah, we cut your part way down. You're still on set every day, but you've only got four or five lines. Oh, yeah, you know? uh, John Panette was not in the movie. Was he? No, he, he was, was in not. the play. He was in the yeah. play. Yeah. 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 So we bring it full circle, get John Panette back in. Yeah. Uh, Darren, Show number one, two, three, four, five, six with us. Yes. It's uh, it was good talking with you again. The best one, obviously, because Sam's here. Yes. Hey. Yeah, you agree. Uh, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2013, 2014, and now 2020. Wow. Was it 2014 was the last one? Yeah. Wow. Six years ago. Oh, my God. Was that the one with Kenny? No, that was 2013. Whoa. Because I even remember we were at the hotel. I remember that whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, That's right. Five. That was the only one we did yep. uh, off out of studio. Yes. And then now this one. Well, we look forward to, uh, to Anything Goes, the mm -hmm. podcast, which will be available on YouTube, you say? And, and then, uh, I guess audio versions as well yep yep and, and uh, my uh, website's comedyhorror.com if you're interested my album's on all the usual places that you can buy albums perfect all the usual places yeah. a and b sound sam the record sure. man yeah. all those places and yeah eight track yep and cassette all right well it's great talking with you again darren well thanks, uh, enjoy guys. the snow Yes, and hopefully, if I'm out in uh, November, I'm supposed to. Let's hope the pandemic uh, makes that happen, but that's when I'm supposed to be in Vancouver. But we'll see. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll see. see you then. Okay, thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks very much. Cheers.